Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be discussing what you see right there behind me. We're going to be talking about this and though it might not look like much or like anything important, what you're looking at right here is a result of a study that started over a decade ago with one single purpose, one really interesting purpose. An attempt to grow an actual plant by using nothing more than natural lunar regolith or essentially lunar soil, the soil from the moon, just to see if it first of all works and then to see what sort of problems these plants experience if they do grow. And as you can kind of tell from this picture, the spoiler here is that it worked. And it worked more than once and with different plants. And this is a really groundbreaking study with some really exciting news for future potential exploration of the moon or any colonies that decide to settle there. It means that we can actually grow certain plants using nothing but lunar regolith which seems to have just enough nutrition for several plants to grow successfully. But let's discuss some of the problems here in a little bit more detail. And also, I guess, let's start with the obvious questions. Where exactly did all of this lunar soil come from? And what was the reasoning behind this study? Well, all of this is technically a part of a much larger and much more explored field known as astrobotany. The attempt to grow various types of plants in, for example, zero-g conditions in the process discovering any potential problems these plants might experience, and also establishing whether these plants could be used for potential future space missions. With many different successful examples in the last few decades from various space agencies, but with the single ultimate immediate goal, something like this. Exploring the idea of establishing a greenhouse on, for example, Mars or the Moon, while also using as much of the local resources as possible, with the principle known as ISRU, or in-situ resource utilization. But despite all of these successes with various plants, such as for example Xenia plant you see right here, that produced an actual flower, there were not a lot of attempts to try to use for example Martian or Lunar regolith for one simple reason. It's somewhat difficult to come by and there isn't really a lot of it going around. We don't really have any Martian regolith and the Lunar regolith from the Apollo missions is relatively uh, rare and relatively expensive. There are, however, different universities and even different companies that can sell you what's known as Martian dirt or lunar dirt, representing a kind of a mixture that sort of mimics Martian soil or lunar soil. With at least one video from the University of Central Florida even sort of showing us how all of this is made and to some extent even offering to sell us some. So technically you can actually buy it pretty easily. And several studies in the past, including the one we've talked about in one of the previous videos somewhere right there or in the description, have attempted to grow various plants in them and were to some extent successful. But remember, simulation is not really the same as reality. Especially because the dirt that was produced here on Earth lacks a lot of different hazards present on the Moon and of course on Mars. With one biggest hazard being of course things like radiation. And because of this, lunar regolith or Martian regolith is still different from what we produce artificially. And when it comes to real lunar soil, only a few studies have been conducted with really different purposes. For example, establishing that uh, lunar soil did not contain any dangerous pathogens and that the plants that were, for example, smeared in this dust would still survive and thrive afterwards. And so prior to this study, none of the plants were ever grown in lunar regolith brought back to Earth from uh, the Apollo missions. Oh, and quick clarification in regards to what's known as the moon tree or lunar tree. There are several interesting trees planted on our planet that are often referred to as the moon trees. And this is actually trees grown from 500 different seeds that were taken into orbit around the moon by this astronaut Stuart Rusa, who was the command module pilot of the Apollo 14 mission back in 1971. And he just have happened to somehow snuck in approximately 500 different seeds that flew with him around the moon but never really landed on the surface of the moon. And so despite the name, they really have nothing to do with the moon other than the fact that they actually traveled in space. And interestingly, it wasn't really until the 90s that NASA finally realized these trees even existed. And so currently there's a project trying to find out where these trees have been planted and what happened to the rest of the seeds. But anyway, that's a story for another day. Back to the plants that were grown using lunar regolith. So back in early 2000s, when Rob Furl, who's on the left, and Annalisa Pohl, who's on the right, looked much, much younger, had this brilliant idea. They asked NASA for some samples from the Apollo missions in order to see if they could grow certain plants and if anything can actually work. 
But it took 15 years and a renewed interest in lunar missions for this to finally come true. Their request was finally granted and it took them approximately a year and a half to complete their mission and to finalize their study. And their questions were actually really simple. What really happens when you try to grow various plants in lunar regolith? Are plants going to be able to do it? Is anything going to happen to the plants? Are they going to go through a lot of stress? Are they going to change in any way? And would plants technically be able to grow in a lunar greenhouse? Can we have something like this? A functioning colony on the moon with actual greenhouses that grow plants using soil from the moon. But to test all of this, they had very, very little material to work with, approximately 12 grams. All of this came from the Apollo 11, 12 and 17 missions, collected by the astronauts and obviously brought back to Earth in various ampules. And so the scientists here had to improvise and use something a little bit smaller than they would usually use in order to make this happen. They used the bacterial wells that are normally used to grow bacteria, with each of them getting approximately 1 gram, with 12 of these in total. And the plant they decided to use is this right here. It's known as Thalecress, also known as Arbidopsis thaliana, a relatively small flowering plant that's widely used in science because it's the first plant to ever had its genome sequenced. Which means that in terms of genetics and in terms of genetical studies, this is the best plant we have on planet Earth. A plant that, at least in theory, is also edible, at least uh, to some extent. It might not be very delicious, but it does provide a little bit of nutrition. And it's also a plant that has already been grown in space several times, so there's a lot of data available to see what happened to it in the past. And in this experiment, the scientists planted these plants in four different conditions, as you can see above. Three different Apollo missions, and that synthetic soil that you can buy online, as well as some other conditions including volcanic ash and some other extreme environments. And I guess the biggest surprise is, well, it's really right here in the picture. This is what happened after six days. Every plant grew just fine. And every plant looked uh, more or less okay in terms of health. Or at least they did initially. Here's what happened after approximately 16 days. So as you can see here, even though the plants did survive, they were actually struggling quite a lot whereas the plants grown in the simulated soil were doing just fine. With the first important discovery here being that, well, lunar soil seems to actually provide enough conditions for plants to at least sprout and start growing, but whether they survive afterwards is a different question. This of course means that the soil here does not interrupt the hormones inside the plants, as some of the previous studies implied in the past. And in the end, depending on where the soil came from, the outcome was a little bit different. For example, it's quite clear here that the samples from the Apollo 12 mission were slightly better for growing these plants. As a matter of fact, in this picture, the plants seem to be doing the best. But the plants that were growing in, for example, the Apollo 11 mission soil were actually exposed to much harsher space conditions. And because of this, as you can see from this image, not a lot of them did well, with the Apollo 17 mission being somewhere in between. And here it becomes visible just by looking at the plant itself that it's really struggling. Specifically, it turns purple, which is response to various types of oxidative stress. In other words, the plant is really struggling with a lot of uh, oxidation going on, which was most likely caused because the soil here was exposed to much higher radiation in the past. With all of the plants grown in the Apollo soil overall being a lot smaller, growing and developing with a lot more difficulty, and also having much less developed roots at the end. But here it wasn't just the appearance showing all of this. The further genetic analysis established what the scientists kind of thought from the beginning. The plants grown in the Apollo soil were expressing approximately 1000 different genes, which are mostly expressed in various stress conditions. Which of course means that the plants in this case were definitely not enjoying growing in this particular soil, but were still trying their best and using all of their genetic tools to try to survive despite everything. And this genetic data is super important for any future mission that's going to be going to the moon or to Mars. Mostly because this shows how we can maybe change this in the future, how we can help these plants to grow in this type of soil, and what sort of conditions we can provide for them in order to avoid these stresses in the future. With most of the stress very likely being caused by the effects from the cosmic radiation and also a lot of tiny iron particles and even tiny pieces of glass that are generally present all over the moon. And so maybe if we were to somehow filter the soil or remove these particles, the plants might do better in the future. And so the natural next question, especially for the upcoming Artemis mission, is to figure out exactly how to change the regolith present on the moon 
to make this a little bit more effective and to actually create potential conditions for future plants to grow much more successfully. Which of course makes this study one of the most important studies for the future of human colonization of the moon. Something that took the scientists approximately 17 years in total, with most of it of course being just waiting. Waiting for the samples. But just the fact that all of the plants sprouted and all of them grew at least to some extent is already quite groundbreaking and quite surprising. Something that even scientists themselves did not really expect. But once we get some more information or once we get the part 2 of this particular experiment, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support the channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.